Hi everyone and you're very welcome to today's Saturday session where our focus for today is going to be all around bacteria. So bacteria falls underneath the kingdom called Monera and it's one of five kingdoms that we have. So the five kingdoms we have are plants and animals, we have fungi, we have protista and amoeba is an example you would have looked at in that and then finally we have Monera. And more specifically within Monera, the example we're going to focus on is bacteria. Now, bacteria are more commonly known as prokaryotes. So they're opposite to us. Okay, we're eukaryotes. And when we mention the word eukaryote, I'll just write this down here. That's an organism that has a nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles. Okay, so we're an example of a eukaryote, whereas bacteria are known as prokaryotes because they don't have membrane-enclosed nuclei or organelles. Now, bacteria are classified according to their shape. So there's three different shapes that bacteria generally have. They can be spherical, known as cocci. They can be rod-shaped, known as bacillus. Or they can be spiral-shaped. And we can see that in the diagram over here. There's our spherical, there's our bacillus, or rod-shaped, and there's our spiral, or helical-shaped. Now, a couple of examples of each one. An example of spherical bacteria will be the one that causes pneumonia. Um, the example of a disease caused by rod-shaped bacteria will be TB. And an example of a disease caused by spiral-shaped um, bacteria will be cholera. And it is important to know an example of each one of those. Now, the overall general structure for bacteria is going to remain the same. There might be slight variations between different types of bacteria. So a couple of differences that we can see straight away between a bacterial structure and maybe a cell structure that you would find in animals or in humans is this structure here called the flagella or flagellum. So singular is flagellum, plural is flagella. Now, we have a singular flagellum here. They can exist the whole way around the bacterial structure and what they're generally used for is movement. So they will whip around causing the bacteria to move. We also have this protective structure on the outside called a capsule. We have these sticky structures here called pili, is plural, pilus for singular, and that allows the bacteria to stick to different surfaces. We have a cell membrane, which is very similar to plant cells and animal cells. We have our cell wall, which is similar to what's found in uh, plant cells. We have our cytoplasm, which is going to support all the structures on the inside. We have ribosomes, which are also common to animal and plant cells. And one main different structure that a bacterial cell has is this plasmid. Okay, so this is a circular piece of DNA. We can see it in here. And that's actually the part of the bacteria that's responsible for antibiotic resistance. Now, a couple of the different functions of each of the organelles. We have our cell wall, very similar structure to plant cells. That's responsible for the shape and structure of the cell. We have our cytoplasm. That contains the ribosomes and storage granules. But there's no mitochondria or chlor chloroplasts because remember, they're prokaryotic. They don't have membrane-bound organelles. We have nuclear material. So we have a single chromosome of DNA. We have our capsule, which is outside, that's used for protection. We have the flagella, there could be one or more of them, they're responsible for movement. And then we have our plasmid, which is a circular piece of DNA, and that contains the genes for drug resistance. So if antibiotic resistance was to develop within bacteria, it's the plasmid that's responsible for that. Now, bacteria reproduce asexually. So when we mention asexual reproduction there, it means there's only one parent and there's no sex cells produced. And the exact process by which bacteria re uh, reproduce is binary fission. Okay, really important that we know that because that does come up as an exam question from time to time. So the reproductive method of bacteria is binary fission. So how does this happen? Well, the chromosome is going to attach to the plasma membrane and the DNA will be replicated. So if we have a look at a typical bacterial cell here, make sure we have a double layer on the outside, Inside, we're going to have our genetic material, which is going to attach itself to the plasma membrane at the side. That's our cell wall on the outside for plasma membrane on the inside. And that there is going to be our chromosomes. Okay, our chromosome. Now, over here, what we should see happen in the first stage is that genetic material, which has attached itself to the outside, will be replicated. 
so we'll get an exact copy of it over here okay that's going to be really important because by the end of this we want to have offspring they're going to be identical copies to the parent bacteria so we need to have the exact same dna so it's after being replicated now the second stage which is going to happen is that the cell is going to elongate and the two chromosomes are going to separate from each other so it's going to look something like this it's much longer than the first one we still have our cell wall we still have our plasma membrane on the inside we now have our two copies of genetic material one on this side and one has moved over to the other side okay for the next stage the cell wall is going to begin to divide the cell in two so it's going to grow more and more so it'll start to go inward like so we have one copy of the genetic material over here other copy over here and we can see here towards the center, it's beginning to pinch in. So one cell is beginning to come to, beginning to divide into two. And then eventually what we'll be ending up with is two identical daughter cells. Okay, so two identical cells. Now this can happen really, really quickly. So maybe even once every 20 minutes. So one bacteria is going to become two those two will become two in turn. So within the space of about 40 minutes, that one bacteria has become four. In turn, each one of those offspring will produce two. So four will become eight, eight will become 16, 16 will become 32 and so on. So it's constantly doubling, okay? And this can happen really, really quickly. So bacterial numbers can rapidly, rapidly increase. And we'll see that later on when we look at the growth curve of bacteria. Now we've mentioned this already, but bacteria reproduce asexually. Their offspring are gen genetically identical to the parent bacteria, and they evolve really slowly due to reproduction methods. They can evolve rapidly due to mutation, and antibiotic resistance is one example of that. And that's exactly what it's saying here. Mutations can lead to antibiotic resistance, and an example of that is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So this is the MRSA bug. Sometimes you would have heard of that in hospitals. Really, really difficult to eradicate because it's resistant to most forms of antibiotics. Now, we're going to have a look at endospore formation. So some bacteria can withstand unfavorable conditions by producing endospores. So maybe they're in a condition that's too warm for them, too cold for them, the pressure is too high, there isn't enough oxygen. Whatever the situation is, they can produce this endospore which is going to help them to survive. So endospores are formed when the bacterial chromosome replicates. The parent cell will then break down and the endospore, which is this structure here, will remain dormant. Okay, so it's not going to be reproducing, it's not going to be replicating, it's just going to remain dormant until conditions are favorable for it again. Now, one of the new strands will become enclosed in this tough walled capsule, so separate from the capsule that's on the outside of the bacteria, that tough walled capsule is called the endospore. The parent cell will break down, endospore will remain dormant, and when the conditions become favorable again, the spore will start to absorb some water because that water is going to break the endospore down. The walls will start to break down, and then that particular bacteria there, that can start to reproduce by binary fission to produce more of itself. So it can start to replicate then, okay? So it's a really, really um, unique, it's a really um, cool, I suppose, adaptation of bacteria that they can produce this endospore to allow them to survive or withstand unfavorable conditions. Now we're going to look at the bacterial nutrition for the next couple of minutes and how bacteria actually get their food. And there's two different ways in which this can happen. So two words we're going to focus in on, first of all, is the idea of auto and hetero. So if we see the word auto in science, that's going to refer to self, whereas hetero is going to refer to different. Okay, so trophic referring to food. So autotrophic is the organism is going to make their own food, whereas heterotrophic, they're going to get food from other organisms. Okay, so for example, we're heterotrophic because we get our food from other sources. Plants will be autotrophic because they make their own food through photosynthesis. And bacteria can fall into both of these categories. They can either be autotrophic, in which they make their own food, or they can be heterotrophic, where they get food from other sources. So a couple of examples of autotrophic bacteria. There's two types. Well, there's more than two types. We're only going to look at two of them here. We can have photosynthetic bacteria or chemosynthetic bacteria. Now, again, just to break down a couple of the words here. So photo in science referring to light. Chemo referring to chemicals. 
And if we look at the word synthetic, it's derived from synthesis, which is the making of. Okay, so how are these particular bacteria going to make their food? So photosynthetic, they're going to use light to make their food, whereas chemosynthetic, they're going to use chemicals to make their food. Okay, and that's exactly what it says here. So photosynthetic bacteria, they use light energy to make their food, and an example of that would be purple sulfur bacteria. Whereas chemosynthetic bacteria will use energy from chemical reactions to make food. So an example of this would be nitrifying bacteria, which convert ammonia to nitrates within the nitrogen cycle, which is something that you look at as part of um, ecology. Now, heterotrophic bacteria, on the other hand, they're going to get their food from other sources. And again, we can break this down into two separate types where we have saprophytic bacteria and we have parasitic bacteria. OK, we're actually going to start off parasitic bacteria down here because parasite you've probably heard of before. You might have heard of parasites living off of humans, but anything referring to a parasite. It's an organism living off a live host. And it's usually to the detriment of whatever it's living off of. So parasitic bacteria is going to take food from a live host, whereas saprophytic bacteria, they live off dead organic matter. So it's the opposite. So it's not living, they live off dead organic matter. So an example of this will be bacteria of decay in the soil, whereas an example of parasitic bacteria would be Bacillus anthracis, which is actually the bacteria that causes anthrax, so the disease anthrax. So just an overview of bacterial nutrition, we can have autotrophic bacteria, examples of that would be photosynthetic, so they use light to make their food, or chemosynthetic, which is bacteria that use chemical reactions to make their own food, or heterotrophic bacteria, where we can have saprophytic bacteria, so they're bacteria that live off dead and decaying matter, whereas parasitic bacteria live off um, a live host. So some bacterial growth factors then. For bacteria to have maximal growth, so to be able to reproduce as quickly and as efficiently as possible, there's a couple of conditions that need to be perfect for them. So they're going to need a food source and they're going to need environmental conditions to be closely monitored. And there is lots of different factors that can impact the growth of bacteria. One of them is temperature. So some bacteria will be more suited to more hotter temperatures, others will be suited to more colder temperatures. The concentration of oxygen, some bacteria prefer there to be more oxygen, some prefer there to be less oxygen. pH can have a massive impact there as well. So some would prefer lower pHs, some more acidic pHs, but some bacteria prefer more basic pHs. The external solute concentration, so you might have heard of this being used in food preservation before. So if you're a little bit unfamiliar with that, one really quick example of how um, external solute concentration can impact on bacteria. If you think of tuna, which comes in um, in tins filled with brine, so re a really, really salty solution. By osmosis, because the bacteria are in a really salty solution, there's actually more water within the bacteria than there is in the salty solution outside. So by osmosis, water will start to leave the bacterial cell and go into the salty solution, causing the bacteria to die. It's the exact same thing as uh, canned fruit. So if you ever buy fruit in a can, that's in a really sugary solution. Exact same process would happen there. The bacteria is going to be really, really impacted if there is some bacteria within the food because there's more water within the bacterial cell. So it's going to leave from the bacteria, go into the sugary solution. And because the bacteria is losing the water, they'll die. So the external solute concentration can have a massive impact on the growth of bacteria and pressure as well. So we're going to focus in on each one for a couple of minutes. The first one is temperature. So the ideal growing temperature for most bacteria is between 20 and 30 degrees. So you'll probably recognize there that room temperature actually falls within that range. Now, some can tolerate much higher temperatures without their enzymes becoming denatured. So enzymes are really, really important for bacteria. This whole idea of enzymes being denatured, that's where the enzyme loses its shape. And the shape is the most important thing for enzymes, so they basically become useless. Low temperatures will slow down the rate of reaction of enzymes, resulting in slower growth. But there can be some bacteria that will be more suited to these lower temperatures. One interesting thing to notice as well there is that body temperature, for the most part, is outside the range for the optimal growth. So that's why bacteria, for the most part, won't have a massive impact on our bodies. pH is the next, uh, next factor which can impact growth. So if a bacterium is placed in an unsuitable pH, maybe it's too high or too low, the enzymes will become denatured. So the enzyme will lose its shape again. It's effectively gonna become useless. The ideal growth is at or near pH seven. So that's the neutral pH. 
but there are some bacteria that can tolerate higher and lower range pH values. Oxygen concentration also has a massive impact on bacterial growth. So we have two types of bacteria. We have aerobic bacteria and anaerobic bacteria. So aerobic bacteria require oxygen for respiration. They absolutely need oxygen for respiration to occur. Whereas aero anaerobic um, bacteria, they do not require oxygen for respiration to occur. Now, we can actually break anaerobic bacteria down into two different types. We have facultative anaerobes and we have obligate anaerobes. Now, one thing my students actually pick up on uh, when we're going through enzymes is how both of these words actually relate to French. So if you're studying your subjects in French, you might have heard the words obligatoire or obligatory, meaning compulsory, and facultative, which is optional. So obligate um, or obligate anaerobes, they can only respire in the absence of oxygen. Okay, it's absolutely obligatory. There has to be no oxygen there for them to be able to respire. Whereas facultative anaerobes, they can actually respire with or without oxygen. So obviously, if they're falling under the bracket of anaerobic bacteria, they can re or respire without the presence of oxygen. But even if there is a small bit of oxygen there, they're still going to be able to respire. External solute concentrations, we've kind of already mentioned this already, but bacteria can gain or lose water by osmosis. So just a really quick example of that, if we have a semi-permeable membrane and we have a lot of water molecules on one side of that semi-permeable membrane and very few on the other, by osmosis, so it's a, a passive process, no energy is required, those water molecules are going to move from one side to another until there's an equal concentration on both sides. And that's exactly what happens for the food preservation techniques that we've already mentioned. So if we consider the bacteria, let's say, for example, this was the bacteria here on the left hand side, a vast amount of water molecules there. But on the outside or in maybe the tin that they're in, the tuna tin or the fruit tin, it's a really sugary concentration or a really salty concentration. So the water is going to move from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. And because the bacterial cell is losing this water, it's eventually going to die off. So food preservation techniques are based off of this. Pressure, so high pressures generally will inhibit growth. But again, some bacteria can withstand high pressures. And then pressure tolerant bacteria for use in bioreactors can be formed by genetic engineering techniques. So bacteria are really, really important for food production. A lot of that is going to happen within these bioreactors, which were mentioned there, and they need to be able to withstand high pressures in order to actually be able to make the food. So bacteria can actually be altered using genetic engineering to make sure that they can withstand that high pressure. Now, what is the importance of bacteria? Normally, we just hear of the negatives associated with them. So one massive benefit of them is in food production. So lactobacillus, which is a type of bacteria, you might have heard of lactose intolerant before. So lactose, lactobacillus are used to convert milk to products such as cheese and yogurt. Genetically modified bacteria, so for an example, E. coli, are used to make products such as insulin, enzymes, drugs, food flavorings and vitamins. So massively important in the food industry, but also for any patients who might need insulin so they can be genetically modified again so that these bacteria actually make insulin, which can then be extracted and given to diabetes patients. Some negative effects associated with bacteria. Obviously, some of them can um, cause disease. So one of these being the Bacillus anthracis, which we seen earlier on, which causes anthrax in humans. And if they enter the body through a wound, they can multiply and actually affect the nerves and activity of muscles. And because they can reproduce really, really quickly, that can be quite dangerous for people. Other bacterial diseases include TB, tuberculosis, typhoid, and cholera. So just a summary of everything we've looked at so far, beneficial effects of bacteria, lactobacillus food production converts milk to yogurt and cheese, and then antibiotics can be formed by some microorganisms. So some bacteria can actually form antibiotics, which can then be used to kill off um, further bacteria if there was an infection. And genetically modified bacteria can produce insulin, drugs, and enzymes so that patients maybe, for example, suffering from diabetes can be treated. Some harmful effects, they cause disease in humans and animals. They can cause food spoilage as well and some bacteria are responsible for tooth decay then as well. Now, one of the benefits of bacteria that we've seen on the last slide there was the idea of antibiotic production. Now, antibiotics are actually used to kill bacteria, so it seems a little bit mad that a bacteria can actually be used to create the substance that eventually we're going to use to hopefully kill off bacterial infection. So substances produced by microorganisms that stop the growth of or kill other microorganisms without damaging human tissue, they're referred to as antibiotics.
Okay. Now, antibiotics are used to control bacterial and fungal infections, but they do not affect viruses. Okay. They're completely separate. We need vaccines in order to help um, prevent the severity of an infection with a virus. Antibiotics are for bacterial and fungal infections. Most of them nowadays are produced by genetically engineered bacteria, so we can artificially alter um, the bacteria, and then they will actually start to produce the antibiotics themselves, and then we can extract that and give that to patients. So, quick exam question here, just to see everything that we've looked at so far. Give one example of a beneficial effect of bacteria other than the production of antibiotics, and one example of a harmful effect of bacteria. So that first question there, food production, would be the beneficial one and just make sure and spell out which is the beneficial one and which is the negative one and the harmful is that they can cause disease okay we have a couple of other options there as well we can mention that they um, cause food decay or food to go off and then obviously tooth decay there as well so part two, bacteria reproduce asexually. Name the specific method of asexual reproduction used by bacteria. So that's binary fission. And then part two, describe this process of asexual reproduction. Now when this came up, it was actually a nine mark question. So we needed to have three points, but we could say something along the lines of the DNA is going to replicate. The cell will then elongate. The DNA will move to either end of the cell. That's actually enough for full marks there already, but we'll keep going and see what else we can put down. The cell wall will start to grow. And then the cell is going to split in two. So we had lots of points there. You actually only needed three of them, but more than enough. And you could include a diagram there if you wanted to back up your point as well but it was actually enough to just put the text down in this case. So that's just a recap of the beneficial and harmful effects of bacteria and then reproduction of bacteria there as well. Now, up until this point, we've mentioned about how antibiotics are used to kill off um, bacteria in our bodies or other microorganisms. They can be used for bacterial and fungal infections. But one thing that can develop within the bacteria to make them resistant or immune to these antibiotics is the idea of antibiotic resistance. So antibiotics are used to treat an infection, generally kill most of the bacteria. So a lot of the time, all the bacteria in our bodies will be killed um, that are causing the disease with these antibiotics. But there can be mutations in the bacterial genes, and more specifically, that's on the plasmid. So these mutations can allow bacteria to develop antibiotic resistant. So they're not inhibited by these antibiotics. These bacteria are not affected by the antibiotic, and they can reproduce rapidly and take over a person's body. Multi-resistant bacteria can be resistant to all antibiotics. And an example of that, which we've seen already, is MRSA or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So how does this actually happen, the evolution of resistant bacteria? Well, over here, we have our normal bacteria dividing. So one cell is becoming two. That one then is going to become two in turn. So one becomes two, two becomes four. Now, these non-mutant bacteria, there's been no mutation there. If we were to take an antibiotic at this stage, all of these non-mutant bacteria would be killed if we finished the course of our antibiotic, all going well. But if there was a mutation within the plasmid of the bacteria, this mutant bacterium, or mutant bacteria, if there's many of them, will become resistant to the antibiotic. So these ones down here are going to be killed off by the antibiotic. This one here is not going to be killed off by the antibiotic. And in turn, this one can start to reproduce all of its identical offspring are also going to be resistant to the antibiotic and it's going to start to reproduce rapidly, okay? So it's really, really important if you ever are on antibiotics, let's say, for example, you were prescribed a course of seven days, after three or four days, you're feeling okay. It's really important to finish out that course of antibiotics because if you don't, there is a chance that those bacteria can become resistant to that antibiotic and the antibiotics actually won't work again if you have to take them. Now, the overuse of antibiotics is one of the reasons for antibiotic resistance. So it results in the increased growth of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Failure of some patients to complete a course of antibiotics prescribed to them by a doctor allows the bacteria to survive and regrow. So again, really important to finish out that course of antibiotics. Towards the start of the session, we mentioned a number of factors which can impact the growth of bacteria. Now, generally all bacteria are going to follow the same bacterial growth curve. So along here we have time, so we're going to be examining the bacteria over time and we're going to be looking at the effect on the number of bacteria. 
Now there are four main phases. Sometimes we put in a fifth, which I'll come to in a second. But the four main phases that bacteria will follow in their growth curve are the lag phase, the log phase, the stationary phase, and the death or decline stage. Sometimes we will have what's called the survival stage as well, or survival phase, but those four are generally enough to know. Now, what is happening here in the lag phase is bacteria are getting used to their conditions, okay? Reproduction is really slow, because remember, for bacterial reproduction, one bacteria becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight. They're generally all small numbers. So even though some reproduction is happening down here, the number of bacteria remains really, really small. They're getting used to their conditions, they're getting used to their environment, and they're reproducing. In the log phase, after a couple of, uh, couple of reproductions, the numbers start to get really big. So let's say, for example, 512 will become 1,024, will become 2,048, and will continue to double. So once you get into the bigger numbers, bacteria really, really start to reproduce rapidly. And this is because they're used to the conditions, and generally conditions are going to be ideal in the log phase. So they're going to have optimum temperature, optimum amount of food. They're going to have more than enough oxygen. Everything is perfect for them. And that's called the log phase. So there's exponential or really rapid growth. Now, by the time we get up here to the stationary phase, it's called stationary because it's not really moving. The death rate and the reproductive rate are generally the same. Okay, there's no real increase in bacteria because food is running out, space is running out, oxygen is running out, and bacteria are starting to compete with each other for all of the resources that are there. So they're not as in plentiful supply as they were down here. And then in the death phase, this is where the number of bacteria dying is greater than the number of bacteria that are being reproduced. Again, this is because there's a lack of resources there, there's no space, food has run out, oxygen has run out, so there's going to be a rapid fall in numbers. Now, a small number of bacteria will survive and remain. Okay, one of the conditions could be that they produced an endospore so that they could withstand the unfavorable conditions. They will remain dormant for a considerable amount of time. They will survive in this survival stage. And when conditions are favorable again, they will start to reproduce again and they will go through the exact same growth curve once again. So the lag phase, the log phase, the stationary phase and the death phase. So it's always the same for bacteria. So this just summarizes what happens in each of the phases. So the lag phase, bacterial numbers remain constant. They're adapting to their environment. The log phase, they're reproducing rapidly due to ideal conditions. So food, moisture, oxygen is all perfect for them. The stationary phase, there's no increase in bacteria. The rate of growth slows due to the lack of food, space, and oxygen. And then the decline phase, there's a rapid fall in numbers and the death rate is greater than the reproduction rate. And then the survival phase, a small number of bacteria can survive. It's unfavorable conditions now at this point though, so they might produce endospores to be able to withstand that. Now the final idea we're gonna look at today is the idea of food processing involving bacteria. All of this is gonna take place within a bioreactor, which is a vessel in which biological reactions will take place. And living cells, or bacterial cells in the case we're going to be looking at, are used to make a product. Now, modern bioprocessing methods involve the use of bacteria and other organisms as well, but we're going to focus in on the bacteria for this one to produce a wide range of products. So a couple of these would include dairy products, which is yogurts, cheeses, and then artificial sweeteners as well. Now, there are two main types of food processing, which we're going to examine over the next couple of minutes. We have batch food processing and we have continuous food processing. Now for batch food processing, a fixed amount of sterile nutrient is added to the microorganisms in the bioreactor. So what we mean by a fixed amount is it's the same amount, they know exactly how much is going in, that doesn't change. The microorganisms will be allowed to go through the stages of a typical growth curve, so the lag phase, the log phase, the stationary phase and the death phase. But usually the reaction might be stopped before the death phase because very little product is actually going to be formed because the bacteria are all dying off. Now in the log phase, bacteria are reproducing rapidly okay there's lots of bacteria there as is the case for the stationary phase as well so the majority of the product would generally be formed between the log phase and the stationary phase but there will be some product also formed in the lag phase and the death phase it's just not going to be as much so the product is formed during the highlighted stages it can be little bits of it in the lag phase and death phase as well but it's mostly during the log and the stationary phase and yogurt and many antibiotics are made by a batch culture. So again, there's a fixed amount of nutrient added in. The growth curve phases are allowed to happen. Lag phase, log phase, stationary phase, death phase. Then the reaction is going to be stopped. The product is going to be taken out. 
and then they can start it again. One of the, um, I suppose, downsides to batch food processing is that it's very start-stop. So they allow the reaction to happen, they take the product out, generally the whole bioreactor will have to be cleaned, more bacteria added in, more nutrient added in, and then start it again. So it can be quite time consuming because they're doing it in batches. Okay, they're taking batches of food out. So at the end of production, the bioreactor is cleared out, the product is separated from the rest of the solution and is purified. The bioreactor is then cleaned and re-sterilized and the process can be repeated. So again, can be very time consuming because they are cleaning the entire thing out at the end of the reaction before starting it again. So this is just an example of batch food, uh, batch food processing in action. So over here on the left hand side, this all here is our bioreactor. The nutrients and microorganisms will be added in here. This is going to stir it around. Eventually the product is going to be released and the excess gas, that's really important as well, that the excess gas is somewhere that it can escape to. The product will be released and then the process is over. If oxygen is required, there will be an inlet there as well to allow the oxygen to go in. Now, once the food and the product is after being taken out, all of this would have to be cleared. The entire bioreactor would have to be sterilized. More bacteria will be added in, more nutrients will be added in, and the exact same process is going to happen again. Now, continuous um, flow processing, on the other hand, this is a continuous process, okay? It's not start-stop. So nutrients are continuously fed into the bioreactor. At the same time, the culture medium, which is the medium that contains the microorganisms, is going to be continually withdrawn. That makes sense because any bacteria that will be dying off, they can be removed and can be replaced with bacteria that are still living. So because of this, the bioreactor is constantly maintained at the log phase. So bacteria are always constantly reproducing rapidly. We saw in the batch food diagram a couple of minutes ago that it was actually the log phase and the stationary phase that most of the product was formed. That's exactly why this is done, because if they can maintain it in the log phase, they're going to maximize the amount of product that they're going to form. Okay, they're getting a maximum yield. This process, unlike the batch food processing, can, it, can uh, continue uninterrupted for weeks or even months. So they don't have to start, um, start or start, stop it. They don't have to take everything out and clean it and start again. They can actually just keep it going and going and going once they take out some of the medium and keep putting nutrients in. So again, maintaining constant conditions is difficult. Therefore, continuous flow processing has limited applications. So processes include single cell protein production and water treatment systems as well. Wouldn't be used as much in food production. That generally would be batch food processing, but it does have its uses as well. So again, this is just an example of it happening. So we have our culture medium in here. Nutrients are going to be fed in continuously. Again, excess gas will be released. If oxygen is required, it will go in here. And then the product and the culture medium will flow out continuously. So this is constantly open here to allow this here product um, to constantly escape. And then they're also going to be taking out some of the culture medium as well and replace it with some more microorganisms to, mention, to make sure that it's constantly maintained at the log phase. So batch uh, flow processing versus continuous flow processing. Batch culture is used more often than the continuous flow culture um, just because continuous flow processing, it is quite complex, it is quite difficult. Um, so batch flow processing is generally used more for food production. So a quick exam question here then associated with everything that we've looked at in the last couple of minutes. So food processing is carried out in a bioreactor using microorganisms such as bacteria and some fungi. It can be carried out as batch or continuous flow food processing. So part one, give two factors that affect the growth of microorganisms such as bacteria. So we actually seen five of them there earlier on. So we could have temperature, pH, oxygen concentration. Again, you only need two, I'll write down as many as we can. Pressure, we'd also have external solute concentration and so on. Now, I just wrote down the wide range of answers that were possibly accepted. If it asks for two, make sure and just give two, because if you wrote down three and one of them was incorrect, it would actually cancel out with one of your correct answers. So just make sure you're only given two there. Any of those four will be fine. Explain how either of the factors you named at part C affects growth. So for example, high temperatures, could denature enzyme, enzymes in bacteria. You could also mention that um, external solute concentration could result in water leaving the bacterial cell.
causing death. Okay, part three, distinguish between batch and continuous flow, uh, flow food processing by writing a brief sentence on each. So for a batch food processing, fixed amount of nutrients added, And then you could say for continuous nutrients are constantly fed in. You could also mention about the batch food processing, how the reaction is um, stopped and then started again, whereas continuous, it's constantly going. Part four, I'll do this up at the top. Sketch a plot of the microorganism growth curve, label the axes and label the curve with the five phases shown below. So along the left hand side or y axis, that's going to be the number of bacteria. Time is going to be down here. The curve is going to look somewhat like this. And we'll split it up. So that first one there is the lag phase. That second one there is the log phase. We were stationary. This one here is our death or decline. And then that last one is survival. Okay, so that's all of the stages there. So that's pretty much it for bacteria today. So we've looked at the structure of bacteria and all of the function of the different organelles. We've looked at the difference between batch and continuous flow processing. We've looked at the development of antibiotic resistance, and we've also looked at how bacteria reproduce using binary fission. So just before we finish up today, I'm just gonna show you around the exam revision website. Now, when you log in and make an account, you have the option to sign up to whatever subjects you wish. Leave insert biology being the one we looked at today. Now, within each subject, we're going to have a set of resources which is going to help you to cover the entire leave insert syllabus. So today, for example, we were looking at bacteria. So within the topic of bacteria, we can see here we have video tutorials for you to watch at your own pace again and again and again to pick out all the main features of bacteria. So this one here is going over the structure and reproduction, and we have a list of all the related videos on the right hand side, which will be recommended that you also watch so that you know all of the content associated with this particular topic. Now, when you've watched all of the videos, you can go down, you can choose an MCQ quiz. This is a self-correcting quiz, which you can use to test your knowledge on the topic that you're studying. We also have PowerPoint presentations, which we can use to take down notes into your copies if you wish. And we also have a resource pack as well. So this is a set of H1 notes, which you can access online, or you can download and print so that you can use for your study as well. Not only that, but right down the bottom, we do also have an exam builder feature so this is where you can click in and create an exam associated with the topic so that you can use all of the past state exams and the past mock exam questions so that you can make sure that you know all of the information that you need before going into the final exam. So make sure, have a look at the website, sign up for a free trial, test out the website, and you'll get to see all of the features that the exam revision website has to offer. We'll also have loads of detail there about the upcoming revision courses that we will be holding. These will be at the February midterm break. They'll also be at Easter and coming up to the final exam in May. So you'll be able to find out all of the information um, as soon as it becomes available. So thanks for joining us today for today's Saturday session, and I hope to see you soon at one of the next ones.